Hey coach, welcome to the Basketpedia podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hart, brought to you by System Basketball. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get all of our coaching resources from our full games of dribble drive motion, system basketball games, our film breakdowns, and various clinics we have hosted. On our episode today of the Basketpedia podcast, we are being joined by coach Jeff Lavender of New Plymouth High School in Idaho. We will, we will be discussing his journey from California to Idaho and why he chose the system. So stay tuned. Everybody, it's Coach Hart with the Basketpedia podcast. Today I have Coach Jeff Lavender. He's up in Idaho, but coached many years down here in California in the Santa Barbara area. How are things going, Coach, up in Idaho this morning? Uh, it's a beautiful day, though it's 19 degrees when I got up, but it's uh, sun is shining. It looks like, uh, you know, San Bernardino or Riverside County, but it's the temperature is a little different. Yeah, I'm you got sun out. I don't. Um, it's it's cloudy here. It's um, it's about sixty. So, oh. um, but by by twelve, you know how it is here. Sun will sun will pop through, and it'll be about seventy degrees or so on a beautiful shorts, flip flops, and t shirt Saturday afternoon in 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 California, right? So you you remember yes. those days. Um, for the people that don't know you, Coach, I mean, I know people in California that listen to this podcast um, will know know of you, but do you want to tell everybody a little bit about your coaching background and how you got into this and, and what you're doing now up in Idaho? Okay. Um, I played basketball at uh, Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. I played overseas after I graduated in Germany. And part of my contract was to coach the U18 team for their club there. And I really enjoyed that. And I wasn't too motivated to go back to the U.S. and go to graduate school. So I came back to Westmont and I was an assistant coach with uh, Chet Kammer and Randy Fund, who you probably know they were on the Lakers and went with Pat Riley to the Miami Heat. Uh, so I was their assistant coach for a year. But I couldn't afford to live in Santa Barbara on an assistant uh, salary. So I went and started teaching in the public schools where I coached there at San Marcos High School and Santa Barbara High School for 28 years. And one of my assistants, Scott Garson, uh, took the job at College of Idaho up here in Idaho. And he wanted me to be his assistant. Um, I have family here. I was born in Caldwell. My dad played football at College of Idaho. I grew up up here. So I were kind of semi retired. My wife stopped working. I'm still coaching and teaching, but we have 40 acres. We have uh, Angus cows and ducks and chickens and turkeys and you name it. Okay. Um, Want to want to ask you a little bit about you used to have battles down here with the likes of Willie West, uh, Modern Day, and you were up in Santa Barbara at San Marcos and Santa Barbara High School trying to compete with those guys, and you did match up zone. Um, why did why did you why did you go to that? I probably the answer is simple to try to compete, but um, what were your philosophies behind the matchup? What were you trying to to do, or is it just trying to to keep the game competitive or, or you felt you had to do it to compete? Yeah, probably one of the biggest wins in my early career was beating Willie West and the Crenshaw team with uh, Ollie was the point guard at the time. And we, they had 15 guys. They played 15 guys. Every guy dunked in warmups. And the matchup zone was basically to try to slow those guys down and be able to compete with them. When we would go to LA, you know, the teams usually had better athletes than we did. So we had to figure out a way to uh, stay in games with them. So we still played kind of up tempo, but we played a matchup zone to, to stay in the game. Um, in Idaho, there is no shot clock. So uh, the matchup zone worked great against 
the, uh, when you have a shot clock. At College of Idaho, we led the country in defense for NAIA Division II for two years because we were running the matchup zone. It, people had to shoot the ball. Um, without a shot clock, though, it got me <laughs> kind of frustrating coaching in high school without a shot clock. And I got tired of games in the 30s. So this year, I finally have some personnel I feel I can push the tempo. And so that's why I wanted to try the system. Okay. So before we get into some system talk, um, what coaches helped shape your philosophy on the defensive side of the ball? Um, defensively, uh, Tony Bennett. Um, my player, Taylor Rochesti, was a first-team All-Pac-12 player for Tony Bennett at Washington State. And I really liked uh, the Pac line philosophy and uh, his man-to-man -man principles. And uh, so that is, those are the principles we kind of use for the matchup zone. Again, we always have a man in a matchup zone. So I liked him. And then just we ran a version of this matchup zone when we were in college. So, you know, Randy Fund and um, Chet Kammer, who were my coaches, uh, we went to the national tournament. We played Wisconsin Stevens Point when I was a senior. And uh, we met this team in the final four, had this unknown guy named Terry Porter. And uh, so we, at that time, um, Bennett, the elder Bennett, uh, ran, you know, on the line, up the line, front the post, force baseline. So kind of the Bennett's, I guess, throughout the years is kind of who I have followed. Okay. How about on the offensive side? Who's helped shape it over the years? Um, well, I was a scorer, so I really like to play fast and shoot it quick. And of course, LMU, you know, in the nineties when they had their run, that was fun. And we kind of run the LMU break, uh, you know, just trying to get it out. Um, uh, Greg Popovich, who I can say I'm undefeated against Greg Popovich when he was coach at, uh, there in California. Um, Pitzer. Pomona Pitzer, correct. So he was just starting out as a coach. So we really like, I like him, Randy, uh, excuse me, um, at College of Idaho, we really liked what the Warriors are doing, who he got stuff from Popovich. We like Popovich stuff, you know, hammer action, stuff yep. like that. Uh, so we did a lot of that stuff um, at College of Idaho. And I've kind of, you know, you got to simplify that stuff for uh, high school. And as my players get better, we do more and more of it. Okay. So what year are you in coaching? How many oh, wow. years? Uh, how about 38? 38 years. And we were talking yeah, I, before, we were talking before we hit the record button. I'm going into about my 25th season. So <laughs> guys like us are becoming rare. Um, you know, I mean, that continue to do that, that, do this, but, and it just seems like with all the podcasts and the, the way the system works, it, it seems like people that are more secure in their coaching beliefs and maybe towards the tail end, if you will, um, try this. Um, why do you think that is, is it, does it, cause it's just too crazy or they don't want to be fired. I mean, what are, what are some of the reasons why you feel people don't run the system? Yeah, it's a, it's a, <laughs> you got to step into the darkness off the cliff. You got to commit. Uh, it's very different and you're going to get, even we won our first couple games by uh, over 40 points. And we had, I had parents complain <laughs> about stuff. Playing time? Uh, uh, no, uh, you know, one was, um, oh, my, he, my son, he can't get in a rhythm uh, as, as, I, as I walked by him. And I said, well, actually he never got out of rhythm. And that's, that's all that conversation was. And then another one was mad because we were pressing and, you know, so much and we were up a bunch. Oh, one so, of your parents was mad that you were not being sportsmanlike in, yeah, in, their, in their, in their yeah. opinion. It was our first game. So we're trying to teach tempo and playing right. hard and all those things. And yep. they were mad because we were up 40. So, okay. Just want to, before we, 
before we dive into what you're doing there, um, you've been, we started up these Zoom clinics and everybody's been doing them since March. And I know you've been on a bunch of them. Who are some of the guys on the system side that, that you've learned a lot from or stood out? for you and, and what, what type of things did you take from, from them? Um, well, I guess Gary Smith would be the main guy. I, I played against him when he was coaching at Redlands. I've, I've known of him, you know, I remember his teams in the early two thousands, I was coaching, uh, there was a Santa Barbara guy, Purdy who played for him at Redlands. And, uh, so, I, I really probably sync with him more because he is a defensive coach first. And I feel that's probably my strength is more uh, on the defensive end. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got the, the system Bible, you know, and I went. He hates that. that. He hates that, by the way, when we refer to it as the Bible, but, <laughs> it, but I think all of us, all of us just say it. it it's, I mean, yeah, you're right, man. It's, it's, it's the Bible. Yeah. So that was really helpful. And then, um, then I started listening to, uh, some pod your, some of your podcasts to get a little more, um, information. Um, I, I'm sorry, I forget his name, but he's the guy that came up with chaos there on the East coast with the um, two, two press. Nick, Medis uh, Nick Medicis. Yes. Nick. I, I liked, uh, I'm kind of trying his press a little bit along with a bunch of other stuff that I've done in the past. Yeah. Um, and then offensively, I started putting in kind of dribble drive um, last year. Yeah. Uh, not so much kind of the, the dribble drive, but just the spacing of it. Right. Um, we'd gone from about a 33% um, offensive rebound team to 40 over 40 just having the big guy away from the ball and coming in and wedging and getting those weak side boards. It, I think that's really helped us and it's really helped us get to the rim better with our spacing, not having a big guy there on the block on ball side. Um, everybody with everybody is doing that spacing now, you know, the, Oh yeah. You watch the NBA college. You got two guys in the corner. Um, it's just really hard to cover yeah. uh, a guy from kid from, Southern California, Santa Barbara. He's a coach at Eastern Washington. They're fun to watch. Uh, Shantae Leggins, he played at Dos Pueblos High School in Santa Barbara. So um, I talked to him a lot and what he's doing because they they score a lot of points. They're fun to watch. Okay. So, um, so, you're, so you're at New Plymouth and you decided that you're going to run the system. How did you approach it? Did you just have a meeting with your players? Did you go to your admin? I know the, the system Bible tells you to do, to do all this crazy stuff, Jeff. And, and you probably heard me say this on podcasts. I just think it's ridiculous that you need to go make a PowerPoint to justify what you're doing. If you ran flex, you would never do that. So, correct. I mean, so what did you do? Um, we were fortunate and we were able to get in 10 games this summer before everything got shut down. Um, and my kids had, you know, I had um, 10 kids, 10 to 12 kids is what I've been playing. And the kids loved it. They had a blast. Um, and you could just see the team uh, bonding and how hard my kids played when we did this. It was just fun to watch because I, I was sick and tired of games in the 30s um our division which is 2a in idaho the best teams in the state only averaged 58 points a game that was it and we were the second best defensive team because of our matchup zone we were we held people to like 38 points a game but it's really boring basketball <laughs> and uh so and I've looked at all the teams in the state. So we're going to go the other direction. And we are leading the state in scoring at 77 points right now after three games. Um, and I, I'm going to try to make teams. They're not used to playing fast. In smaller schools, there's not as many ball handlers or good players. So you got a lot of three-sport athletes that don't, don't have a basketball all the time. I would probably never try it at uh, Santa Barbara High School where I usually had a division one player and a couple other college players. 
um, we love to get press because we would break it and get layups and dunks. So because of no shot clock and the style of play here in 2A basketball in Idaho, I, I think it's a good fit. Okay. So what, what, what system goals did you decide on? Um, okay. Number one, we're trying for 80 shots. Okay. We're trying to shoot 43s. We are trying to force 25 or more turnovers. We want to uh, have a shot of 40. We're going 40% on the offensive rebounds, which I, we've been in the 45 to 50% rebounds. We're pretty big for um, a 2A school, so we've been pounding people on the boards. And then differential of, you know, 20 more shots in our team uh, than our opponents and 10 less turnovers than our opponents. So those are the things we're looking at. And you said you've played four games so far? Uh, three games, three yes. Games. Okay. Um, would you know offhand in those three games if you've hit all five goals? Um, our first two games, um, we scored 88 and 81 points, and we reached every goal. Last night, I purposely went on a three-hour trip a long way away on a road game to get us ready. We start conference next week, and uh, it was rough. The opponent shot 37 free throws. Um, I had a couple guys foul out. Uh, we had to change a few things at halftime. We didn't go, we couldn't run the system. So I have to figure out ways uh, to keep playing fast, even though we're getting every, you know, everything was a foul on us. Got it. So, um, what's the roster size? Um, I'm going with 10 guys right now, 10 guys. I, and, one, and I have three groups. Okay. I have my, basically my starting five. I'm starting each quarter. Oh, and let me just say, um, I, I let my groups sub themselves and we're not doing a time limit. We're doing possessions. So down and back, down and back, four possessions, the next group's in. And I don't man, the game's going so fast. There's no way I would have to have two coaches just in charge of subbing. How did you come up with that one? I just, it was summer and I'm, I'm there by myself coaching okay. and I, I cannot do that. And the kids were great. They just, man, they knew when it was their time, they were at the scores table. So are you going five in five out? Yes. With 10 guys. So you're just basically with, rolling two groups. Um, Yes, let me. So I have three groups. Okay. So my best group and the first two games, I found my my three best players with the two worst players had the best plus minus of any group. So I want to keep those guys kind of playing a little bit together. So I start each quarter and I, I call it my starting group. They get one rotation. They get one shift. OK, okay. Then we morph into two, A and B, for the rest of the quarter. Okay, then second quarter, we'll start with the starting group again, and then that group ends, and then they go back to A, B, A, B. Okay. So I've seen us wear down teams with just 10 guys uh, about every game when we can play fast. Um, I haven't seen our guys get tired except in a one day on the summer we played three games back to back to back and by the third game it's the only game we lost in the summer and we just couldn't press because we were too tired okay so you talked about foul trouble in the last game um what other things maybe early on in the season are you guys struggling with to kind of get what the system is it just pace i mean what what, what type of things um, just get, keeping the pace up, keeping it up. Um, you know, I was, again, we've only had one road game and it was against a really physical team and, and they shot 37 free throws. So, uh, we couldn't really press. We, I, second half, I kind of went old school and went to, um, some trapping in the half court out of our matchup zone, uh, that was more successful. We still came back and almost won the game. <laughs> but again, my best player fouled out and we had just a lot of issues. 
So I, we're going to do a lot of different trapping, um, a lot of half court stuff. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, I'm friends with Rob Hammer. He and I yep. have been business partners and uh, he kind of does. I've talked to him a lot, too. Uh, one interesting thing idea I got from him is one group runs kind of a diamond press back into a, a one, three, one half court trap. Mm -hmm. And then the other group runs a two, two, one, the chaos guy type press back into a two, three zone. Cause I have a six, six, 235 pound big guy on that group. And then we trap, out of the funnel. I don't know if you know what the funnel, the elbows, you go up, we don't trap in the funnel. We trap everything outside the funnel with the yeah. strong side guard and forward. I call that B. I label my areas of the court A, B, C. So, okay. So top is A, wing is B. Okay. B is corner. Cause I'll just go and call my point guard over and say, Hey, we're, we're what, whatever we're, we're in B. So they know we're just trapping whenever the ball goes to B. Okay. Yeah. And I got funnel from Majerus. Uh, I went to a lot of Majerus practices and games because Scott Garson was uh, coaching there. So he uses the funnel. Okay. Um, so that was going to be my next. So when you're, when you're not making the adjustments like you did the other night, what are you falling back into in the half court? Are you falling back into the traditional system half court trapping or are you being more conservative like, uh, Westhead would do on occasion just be like in a two, three zone to save energy. No, we are trapping everywhere. So okay. one, three, one, we're trapping everywhere. Um, except in the, uh, two defense or two, three, um, we don't trap in the funnel, but we trap everything outside of the funnel. Okay. So we're are trying to, Okay, so are you you're, are you doing Gary Smith method where he doesn't trap corner? No, we're trapping the corner. Okay, because Gary Gary's the Gary's the the oddball, I guess, if you wanted to call it that, where he would just play what he would refer to as lock coverage when the ball would go to the corner. So um, he just thought he just feels that the rotation was too far and it caused problems when they would trap the corner. And I know as a offensive player, uh, coach, I don't want the ball in the corner because uh, that's that's a tough, you can get stuck. Is everybody trying to run with you or are they playing since you don't have a shot clock? I don't know how you guys run the system. So maybe you can enlighten me because I've had some people on that don't have a shot clock and, and run the system. But I would just think someone would go four corners and make that shift like a nightmare for you, like make you foul, make you do something to end the shift. I mean, um, any, everybody running with you? No, no. The first game they went to four corners and they tried to, you know, hold the ball against us. Um, but you know, we're in a one, three, one. And again, we're pretty big and athletic for our level of basketball. So again, the defense really has to predicate this, the speed of the game. Um, we really have to get after it defensively. Uh, as I said, a lot of teams will just, they'll run clock for two minutes. Even you know, if you play man, they'll run clock for two minutes. Uh, a very common thing around here is uh, there's two minutes left in a quarter and the, the teams will stall and take the last shot. Okay. That's, that's very common with the, the better teams in our division in the state of Idaho. Well, tell me a little bit about, and we've talked about it a little bit with the defensive stuff, but you've come up with the Grim Reaper philosophy. Can you, can you explain to me how you, how you came up with that and what that means for your program? Well, we are the pilgrims. So when we want to get a little nasty, we need to play like the Grims, not the good Christian pilgrims. We need to get grim like, so the Grim Reaper is kind of the opposite of that. So we got to get dirty. We got to get sticky. We got to get after it. And we do not let the other team uh, just be covered by one guy. We want two people on the ball at all times trying to speed up the game. And obviously these guys played for me when the game, the games were in the thirties all the time. And they're, I, we want to be in the seventies or eighties. So they enjoy that. They play super hard. Um, so 
hopefully I got to figure out some ways against better teams. You know, can I keep doing this against good teams? Uh, so I got to get creative on that. How's the community reacting to it? Are they embracing it or are you getting some feedback? Uh, we're getting some feedback from parents because it's obviously very different. Mm -hmm. uh, one good thing is that when Pil when we knew Plymouth was good, they were really good in the 90s and the early 2000s. They were one of the leading scoring teams in the state. So there's a lot of people that like that. So I think we'll be fine. But the first look for a few people it's very very different than what we were doing last year and we were we were good last year we made it to the state tournament um and we were second in our conference so uh it's very different everybody was expecting us to do the same thing so you're in season so how's scouting going for you because that's a that's a thing in the system are you are you are you not scouting are you scouting what you doing um one thing the only thing i want to know is uh the other team has usually at our level, like one player, one really good player. And one thing I've done for years uh, is uh, run diamond and one, and at times triangle and two uh, were, and last night the other team had a really good player and we uh, in high school, it's very effective. And actually at the college of Idaho, we used it many times. Uh, even in the national tournament, uh, we use diamond and one, uh, and and we trap out of the diamond now in in our system. Where last year I wouldn't trap out of it, now we trap with the diamond people, and we just take away their one bet, the one good player. It's ironic. Um, I had um, Mike Zavada on um, this week on one of the clinics, and he talked about West Head defense and he showed something that he did in high school, a triangle and two full court. So basically he face guard the two best ball handlers and then put the other guys in a triangle and it would just wreak, wreak havoc because you forced other people to handle the ball and you kept the ball out of the be their best player's hands. Yes. So that was a nice little adjustment we learned the other night. Um, so practices, are they shorter for you? Like they say to do, um, what are you doing for practices? Um, we come in and warm up. Um, we do, uh, a couple ball, like passing, uh, we, pilgrim rush, you know, that's, uh, I've heard it called many things. The Lakers would do this with Pat Riley, you yeah. know, just running up and down, getting warm, passing the ball. Um, I've been a shooting coach my whole life. So we do some form shooting for about five minutes and then we're going to shoot a hundred threes. Um, I do take my bigs and we do about, it takes 20 minutes for us to get a hundred shots with three people, two balls at a basket. Um, my bigs are working on uh, post moves, tipping, rebounding, block out stuff. So that's, uh, that's three out of my 10 guys do that. Um, then I practice with our JVs so that I have 20 guys in practice so that we can do a scrimmage. Uh, and we've been going 30 or 40 minutes here in our early season, just trying to get the feel of how to play. So we will play our JVs and we'll just go running clock for 30 or 40 minutes and we'll play them and both teams will sub. The JVs are playing more traditional. So sometimes I tell them, I, I need you guys to run a two, three zone today because that's what we're gonna see. Uh, so the JVs are going against us every day. I think it gives us confidence. We're not, uh, but sometimes though, it might, we get used to maybe not playing great competition in practice. Um, and then at the end of practice, you know, we're going to go do some breakdown stuff, maybe the last 20 minutes. Uh, right now we need to go shoot free throws. We're awful on free throws. Um, maybe work on some, uh, Oh, bef after we do the shooting, before we scrimmage, I'm sorry, we do five on O, getting up and down, just running through our breaks. And we do have right now about four set plays for my best players that I call out of a, a free throw situation or a dead ball situation. Cool. So how many days did you get or, or practice sessions did you get before first game? 
Um, we had 14, which was kind of a lot. We, I waited till the first Saturday to play. I could have played on Tuesday. Um, usually we get about 10 and, uh, you know, up here, there's no, there's no PE class, you know, in Santa Barbara, I had a class every day with all my players that does not happen here. Um, most of my, a third of my players play football. Uh, so we have a lot of things to cover. Uh, so we're, we're not anywhere near where we need to be, but come, you know, February, March, I think we'll, we'll be good. Uh, whereas in Santa Barbara, man, first game in November, end of November, we were, re we were, we had everything in, we're ready to go. Yeah. I mean, down here, you don't really have an off season. You have your three weeks of dead period and you can coach whatever you want. So, so that CIF scrimmage that you used to have, you don't even need anymore. It's like you no. played 35, you played 35 games summer, probably 15, 10 to 12 games in the spring, 10 to 12. You've played two seasons basically of games before your regular season here in California. But so what did you decide to do? Did you do what the book says to do? Did you do a um, install offense week and then an install defense week and then you just played? No, I did not. Okay. I, I just kind of did my own thing. Uh, what, whatever I felt we were weak at. Um, we defensively, I probably, I've spent more time defensively of just getting kids to uh, get to their right spots you know, in all the traps, the weak side guy has to get to the nail and we just got to get better at getting and, and reading and anticipating, uh, just doing, you know, a box trap drill, um, just learning to trap better. Uh, so we probably spent more time defensively than uh, most. And I guess that's just kind of my background and, uh, I guess that's why I said I probably follow Coach Smith a little bit more than anybody else. Okay. Um, so what are, what are your goals and, and stuff for your, for your team for this year? What, I mean, do you, have you set any goals other than system goals? I mean, do you feel <clears throat> if you weren't running system right now after your games, you would be as successful as you guys have been? Um, I don't. The only team goal that I have right now for our guys that I started talking about in June is we're going to lead the state in scoring okay. for two A basketball. Uh, and actually, I think we might lead the whole state of Idaho, but we lead two A right now. We're at like 77 points a game. Um, that's it. And then all of our system goals, just trying to get kids to realize how we're playing and what we're trying to do because again it's very different for all these kids um so that's basically all we've really talked about how well how well are you guys shooting it from the three from three ball end uh our effective field goal right now is overall is uh 42 is where we're at um and for call for high school at our level that's that's pretty good i good think when you're launching 43s Yes, we're, I think that's going to drop a little bit, you know, at uh, College of Idaho, we were over 50 with effective field goals. So, uh, um, and then points per possession, that's something uh, I, we've watched since I got that from Dean Smith. We did it at Westmont when I was coaching, I kept that chart. Um, we're trying to get up closer to 1.0 last year, the last couple of years, we've been at 0.85 offensively. If we're not at 0.85, we're probably not going to win. Um, this year, we're closer to one, and that's kind of a goal we're kind of looking at. It's not one of our main system goals, but it's something that I look at a lot. Yeah. What What are the opponents doing against you? What have you faced so far defensively? Um, switching man and uh, uh, just a 2-3 zone. Um, and... I was surprised at how fast we could play against the two, three zone. You're getting um, it down and getting shots up before it's even set. Yeah. Before it's set or just getting the ball to the high post. Um, we have a little, little loop play that is really effective that point guard drives to the wing, the wing loops up through the middle between the two defenders. Mm -hmm. 
in the weak side wing flashes to the high post, almost always wide open. And then he catches faces. We got two bigs on the blocks and it's basically three against two real quick. So just doing, you know, going fast kids, if you're playing man, I mean, if we're throwing guys at you every about 30 seconds, it's tough to match up. And again, if we don't foul, you know, if we game, we're trying not to foul and trying to just keep the game fast. The faster it is, the better shots we get. Playing with fans or without fans? Uh, 10 fans a game. 10 fans a game. Okay. Now, we don't even want to go there. It's, <laughs> ooh. Uh, that's probably a tough one. So, so, so I noticed you guys are streaming everything. There's probably a reason behind that. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah, here in California, we're not doing so well. We just got, my district just got um, the notice that we're not allowed to work out again anymore. So things are looking not so great here. But hopefully with that vaccination thing that's just been approved yesterday here, that things will look up. Um, and, and we are very thankful. The kids are thankful. Everybody's thankful that we're, at least we're playing. You know, we're, we're definitely not complaining, but um, you can imagine what my parents are like who aren't allowed. I have 12 players and only 10 get to go to the game. So Ooh. that's a nightmare. Put it in a hat and shake it up, I guess. Who knows <laughs> how, you, how you figure that one out. Uh, that's, I don't envy that one. I'd be no. glad that my kids are playing, but that would be, that would be tough. So yeah probably the senior parents may have a priority there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, but any advice you'd give to people that are going to start running this up since it's your first year of advice on, on how to approach it and things that, that are working for you, um, things that need to get better? Um, well, let me start with things that get better. We just went on the road last night and lost uh, a three point game where the other team shot 37 free throws and we couldn't press. We couldn't get the tempo faster. We did half court traps. We ran a diamond and one and trap. I, you know, I just got to figure out ways to, to speed the game up against physical teams that really don't let you run. They, they're, it's, they're just, it's very physical and it's tough to create space for guys to, to get penetration. So I've got to figure that out because it's my first year doing this, but I think just the overall feeling tone of your team and the kids, they love this. They love playing like this. Uh, everybody gets to play. Everybody's bought in. Um, I, I, I would encourage that being the starting point for somebody who's thinking about doing it. Uh, I, I really believe we're going to have a lot more people wanting to play basketball now, the way we play. Um, obviously we haven't had fans yet, but I think we're going to get a lot more interest of people coming and watching us play. Uh, we're not there yet, but I think over the next couple of years, we can build that. Okay. Well, I just wanted to thank you for coming on Jeff and and coming to the Zoom clinics and, and getting to know you a little bit over the last few months and, and wish your program, you, your family, um, best of health and good luck the rest of the way. Look forward to maybe catching up with you and doing a, doing a recap, see how it went. Okay, well, thank you very much, coach. All righty. Hey coach, thanks again for joining us on this episode of the Baskopedia podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you get notifications for our next one, and we'll see you on the next Baskopedia podcast.